How to deal with nagging injuries. I'm Dr. Mike Isratel for Renaissance Periodization, and you're probably interested in how to deal with nagging injuries. Maybe you have had a few or even currently do. And if you don't have any, maybe you're interested to find out what would happen if one of your clients had one and asked you about it, or if you got one or some in the future. And I'll tell you this, if you train hard enough for long enough, you're bound to get a few of these. So how do we proceed? Because you might notice that you Google stuff, you research stuff. There tends to be the, a lot of things to say and read and learn about training normally, and a lot of stuff to say and read and learn about like, okay, like your pec came off your bone, you broke your knee into 50 pieces, serious injuries, really acute stuff. And sometimes there's just not much to say about like, oh, gee, like, I don't know, my pec tendon kind of hurts a little bit. I don't know if it's bad. You look at like, oh, treatment for pec tendon stuff, and it's like surgery, crazy anti-inflammatories, take six weeks off of training. You're like, oh, it's, good God, it's not that bad. So we're trying to fill the gap here with this video to get you guys aware of what to do when it's just a little bit of a nagging injury, something's bothering you. Turns out there is an easy eight-step plan. I feel like I'm selling you guys some kind of like little cleaning squeegee thing that is a payment plan, but uh, eight step plan that actually it gives you a sort of a, a very good idea of what to do and how to proceed. And uh, even though it's eight steps sounds complicated, trust me, it's super, super simple. So without further ado, the eight step, uh, just kidding, before we get to that, let's talk about what we should be doing to prevent nagging injuries as much as possible. Notice I didn't say completely, because you can't actually prevent it completely. Even all the best training in the world, training is inherently disruptive bad stuff happens, right? It's like, you know, if you're launching, launching rockets into space, a uh, few things are going to go wrong. Some rockets are going to blow up. It's kind of inevitable because the rocket is a controlled explosion, okay? And then some stuff happens, right? But you can engineer a rocket in such a way that reduces the uh, chances of an explosion considerably, right? So what should you be doing in order to prevent most nagging injuries to begin with? First is using good technique. Nothing can help you more than this and nothing can hurt you more than the alternative. If you use bad technique, you're kind of a nagging injury waiting to happen, and probably worse than a nagging injury, a serious acute injury waiting to happen. So good technique is number one, and we have tons of videos about what that is, so please check through our playlists uh, in the YouTube channel, and you'll get a ton of insight on not only examples of good technique for all the major lifts, but also what it really means to have good technique, because we have videos about that as well. Second, making sure to use proper volumes. First point on that, is using volumes that are under your maximum recoverable volume. There's an amount of volume you can do which your body can recover from, and anything above that, it can't. When your body doesn't recover, all the micro tearing that occurs with training turns into nagging injuries. That's one of the most common ways of actually figuring out, oh God, I've been over my maximum recovery volume for some time, is because you start to develop nagging injuries. And if you stay under that, your body has ample ability to recover from training, and then all of a sudden, you have way few, uh, fewer injuries, which is really, really good. Secondly, even within your maximum recoverable volume, it's been shown time and time again in the research literature and a lot of personal experience from tons of athletes and coaches that wildly increasing your volume session to session or week to week uh, really tends to increase your chance of injury. And if it's not an acute injury, thank God, it could still be a, a sort of a presentation of a nagging injury that takes a while to go away or just keeps hanging around. So instead of doing like three sets of squats this week, and six sets of squats next week, maybe go three this week, four next week, five, and so on and so forth, easing into higher volumes in the weeks of a program. Real good idea will, again, reduce the probability that you get a nagging injury to begin with. Point C is having a proper weekly structure. An example of that is not loading the same structures with high volume back-to-back-to-back. -back -back. So for example, maybe you can do high bar squats, five sets heavy, on Monday, on Wednesday, you do high bar squats two or three sets lighter, and then on Friday, you do high bar squats for another five sets, lighter but for high reps and really close to failure, so that you have two really hard squatting workouts but one easier one so that the fatigue you generate in the first workout has a tendency to, to decline considerably before you generate it again. Good way to get an angry injury is to do five sets of hard high bar squats, heavy, Monday and again, Wednesday and again, Friday. If you're a beginner, it probably won't matter because you're, well, too weak to hurt yourself, but as you get bigger and stronger and intermediate and advanced years, that kind of stuff is really, really surefire way to get you uh, at least a nagging injury and possibly much worse. So that's the deal there. And it's something you can avoid entirely by just understanding that there are times to push and times to recede and hammering your body over and over is probably not a great idea. 
to that effect, that consistent hammering, you can do it for a while even in a proper structure. So let's see, we have that Monday, lots of high bar squatting. Wednesday, just a little bit, still a good decent stimulus, but enough to recover a bit. And then we have uh, Friday high bar squats again. If you run that for one week, no problem. If you run it for two, three, four, five, you get a lot of fatigue and then you properly deload and it goes away. But if you've been squatting in some capacity, high bar, same technique for months and months and months, your knees are starting to feel weird, your hips are starting to feel weird, maybe it's time for more variation. So our next to last point is a proper amount of variation. When your exercises start to feel really stale, like at first benches were going well, and then a few months later, your elbows kind of feel weird when you do them, and it doesn't really matter if they're heavy or light anymore, your elbows kind of feel strange, then it's probably tr time to trade off the exercise instead of barbell bench, go to machine presses, Smith machine presses, dumbbell presses, there's 50 other variations you could use, deficit weighted push-ups. And then when you use those variations, they don't hurt your joints anymore. They don't even kind of feel stale or weird so that instead of getting nagging injuries, you can prevent them by making sure to rotate our exercises when they start to have that feeling of like, you know, soon there will be a nagging injury. Now, funny, the first analogy that popped in my head is like, <clears throat> how do you avoid hangovers and really bad experiences when you're drunk? It's difficult to do because when you're drinking, it's difficult to think. But we all have that moment at the bar or the party around our friends where we're like, push, you know, pushing back you know, shot number seven. And we have that feeling like, I feel great. I feel drunk. And you have this little inkling of thought in your head, like if I kept drinking at this speed, I'm going to have a bad time. I'm going to get way too drunk. That's when you sort of go, eh, let's start doing some waters or some sodas interspersed with shots instead of just shot, shot, shots. Same idea here. You have, especially as you're more advanced, developed an intuition uh, when your hips start to feel a certain way from deadlifting, you go, it's time for de deficit deadlifts because I've been down this road before. And if uh, I let the weirdness feeling hang around, not pain, not injury just yet, then it eventually get into pain because I've been here before. So it's good to make sure to get whatever you can get out of an exercise. And then when it starts to go south on you, trade it away for something else. No big deal. Lastly is fatigue management. Kind of mentioned this already, but it's good to really put a fine point on it. Taking off days properly. Okay, team no days off. Well, fucking nobody on that team. Nobody alive is on that team. It's a stupid team. You're not on a team, right? Instagram hashtags are not teams. Uh, recovery sessions are a good idea, especially if you're an advanced athlete in a competitive sport. Deloads, of course, once every you know one to two months. And active rest phases when you're really beat up physiologically and psychologically, two or more weeks off from the gym entirely. Just go play volleyball with your super hot friends and cook hot dogs by the fire on the beach. I'm just reciting what I've seen on various commercials about you know, Coca-Cola and t-shirts and stuff. I don't have any friends. I've never been to a beach and I'm probably not uh, coordinated enough to put a hot dog on a stick. But in any case, things like that, active rest, deloads, et cetera, it's a good way to make sure that all the fatigue that's creeping up that will eventually cause injury gets low enough so that it doesn't. And if you do this stuff, you many times will not even need these eight step action plans for nagging injury because you won't develop them. But if you're training hard, even despite all your best efforts, hopefully that you're doing here, you will get them. And if you're not getting them, your clients might be getting them or your friends might be getting them or someone who comes up to you at the gym and say, hey, I noticed you're big and strong. Uh, my elbow, it, uh, it hurts. What should I do? And you, you might want to tell them something better than, hey, get the fuck out of my face. I'm training. You could always say that, see how it goes. All right. Eight step plan. You have a nagging injury. Step number one is to determine what exactly is going on, not let you have an MRI scanner in your eyes. Jared Feather has one because he's a cyborg. But we don't all have that luxury. You want to know at least generally what's hurting you. And you can just do a little movement, do a little back and forth, kind of feel things out. For example, this is what you could determine. Is it your elbow joint or your tricep tendon? Okay, I had a recent injury that I got from jiu-jitsu, of course, and I was like, oh, my elbow hurts. Is it my triceps tendon? Please, God, no, I need that thing to do presses with, and my triceps are so beautiful. I don't ever want them hurt. So what did I do? Well, I found that my elbow hurt roughly in this position. It didn't really hurt here. It didn't hurt here. And then in the positions in which it didn't hurt, I applied a huge amount of tension through the tricep tendon by literally pressing against uh, an object that won't move. But remember, I'm not in an elbow position that hurt at the time. If it was the tricep tendon, 
clearly applying a high degree of force through it should hurt it, and it didn't. And it didn't hurt over here either when I really pushed on my tricep, but it did hurt right here, and it didn't even hurt with any force. Just moving through this mid-range, I was like, uh, and it, like that. Like, I would grab the remote control to watch TV, and, you know, my wife would be like, hey, can you put on, like, whatever Netflix thing? And I was like, sure, and I'd go, uh, oh, it feels good, uh, back and forth, okay. That's not a tricep tendon. Like it doesn't take an MRI machine or a medical degree to figure that out. That's some stuff inside the joints. You kind of kind of want to figure out what it is that's going on. Because here's the deal. If it's the tricep tendon, gee, you know, you got some trade-offs to make. Because if it is, man, probably everything involving the triceps is putting you at some degree of actually turning that nagging injury into a real serious one. And your, your plan for backing off is going to be pretty considerate. But if you're, or sorry, considerable, if it's just an internal structural injury in the elbow itself, then, you know, if you find exercises that work around it, you could even find tricep movements, maybe partials or something like that, uh, that or some kind of some kind of angle presses don't hurt, then maybe it's not a big deal, right? So, uh, you know, you really, really kind of want to know as much as possible about what's going on. At the very least, find out where the pain is and what's causing it, okay? What's causing it? So another thing you want to figure out is, is it getting worse from further training or staying the same or as if it's getting better? Okay, so if you had an injury that, or say an injury, you had a nagging pain in your knees when you're squatting with the bar, just warming up, you go, oh, fuck, I'm going to die. Maybe, maybe not. You put more weight on the bar or you repeat the, uh, the set with the bar, you go, shit, like, is this really an injury? You do the bar again, but now you're more warmed up. You may find that the pain is halfway as bad as it was or it just goes away completely. And then you go, ah, it wasn't a big deal. And you keep warming up and the pain is gone. It wasn't an injury. It wasn't nagging. It wasn't major. It wasn't serious. It wasn't anything above. It's just some creaks and quirks you got to work out. Like we all have that kind of stuff every now and again. On the other hand, if the bar hurts and then you do it again and it hurts worse and you put 135 on that it hurts a lot, gee, you know, you got some real serious decisions to make. And potentially sometimes session to session or warm up to warm up, the in the, the site doesn't hurt any more or any less. It hurts the same. If that happens for a few weeks, yeah, you're going to have to do something about it. But sometimes one or two sessions, the stuff hurts and it's never like really bad. And then it goes away. That happens, man, maybe like in my experience, 70% of the time when something feels weird or hurts a little bit, you keep going, it hurts the same. At some point it just drops off. And like you wake up on Thursday and you're like, time to do pull-ups. I know my elbow's going to hurt. You go do pull-ups and you're like, what the fuck? We just healed randomly. Sometimes that happens. So there's no reason to freak out. You have to understand that the outcome we're really looking for is, uh, you know, the one we're really going to focus on is if the pain is kind of getting worse, if you continue to do the same thing, right? Now, point number two or action step number two is to delimit the situation and understand what hurts the site and what doesn't. So if it does hurt over time or just doesn't go away or go away over several weeks of doing the same exercises. You have to figure out which movements or exercises hurt and which don't because there's a paranoia that hits. So people say, oh my God, tricep pushdowns hurt my elbow. Something's wrong. I got to take time off of all upper body or all triceps. Oh, hold on a sec. What about skull crushers? What about dumbbell skull crushers? What about the rope attachment? What about overhead work? You could find, and again, maybe seven to eight times out of 10, I found that when a joint or some kind of muscle or something in my body hurts, doing a particular exercise, I try another exercise and it still hurts. I try another exercise and it's just symptom free. Like benching hurts my elbows and then I do deficit push ups and they feel 1000% fine. Well, good God. Look, we'll see in a bit. That's a real different course of action than if everything hurts. So your job, and uh, point number two is to delimit the exercises that hurt the region and the exercises that maybe hurt much less and maybe the ones that don't hurt at all, ideally focusing on that group. Now, here's the thing. You're not sure what's causing it 100%. You don't have medical imaging. It sure as hell would be a giant waste of time for you to go to the doctor because if every time I had an nagging pain, ache or pain, uh, I went to the doctor, I would be going to the doctor literally once every two weeks, okay? So it's not worth your time. It's not worth the doctor's time. Sure as hell isn't worth the money. So what you want to do is alternate exercises. You want to restructure your plan and choose all the exercises that do one of two things. Ideally, don't hurt the area at all or significantly uh, hurt it significantly less and move entirely away from exercises that hurt it a ton, right? Now, here's the thing. If you're a competitive powerlifter and low bar squats are what hurt, you got serious issues uh, at that point. You have to make a decision whether or not you're going to do your meet in six weeks because if you can't low bar squat, it might just not happen for you. 
But if you're in a hypertrophy training or just general strength training, just get strong all over, exercise selection doesn't matter all that much. So basically you want to pick exercises that just don't hurt the area. So let's say your lower back is hurting from bent over rows. You do dumbbell rows and it feels fine. You do machine rows and it feels fine. Well, shit, you just restructure your program to have only dumbbell rows and machine rows and then you hit it up. And that's point number four. Step number four is progress like normally making consistent gains in those alternate moves. If you can't do barbell skull crushers anymore, but you find that dumbbell skull crushers don't hurt you at all in your shoulder, then you just progress normally on dumbbell skull crushers. And guess what? You have amazing training and great progress. And some of the back of your mind, you're like, yeah, I wonder if barbell skull crushers will hurt me, but I kind of don't care for the time being. It's like uh, if you go to a restaurant and you're like, do you guys have that pasta dish I like? And like, no, sorry, no pasta today, but we have a lot of rice dishes. And you're like, fuck, all right, I'll take the rice dish. And then you eat the rice dish and it's really good. And you're like, oh, this is great. And when you're no longer hungry and someone's like, oh man, they don't have pasta today. Like, yeah, I guess not. It'll come back tomorrow. Maybe they'll have it, but I don't care because I got fed one way or another. Remember, there's no golden exercise, so it's okay to alternate and go with it. Uh, a huge, huge thing I've seen over and over as a coach or a practitioner or whatever, just an observer, you know, I'm creeping in, in the back of the gym, always watching everyone, is people will say, oh man, like squatting hurts my knees. You know, like, have you considered just leg pressing and hack squatting? Does that hurt them? And like, no, it doesn't. Well, why don't you do that? And they're like, well, I can't not squat. I'm like, oh, you got a powerlifting competition coming up? And they're like, no. But squats, man, squats, bro. You know, it's like Rocky Balboa shit. He did squats, I think. Uh, don't be addicted to doing specific exercises. It's not dogma. Just do the effective movements that you can. And if some movements don't hurt or hurt much less, gee, that's really what you should be doing. All right. Point number five is to inspect. Step number five is inspect. And that really means that you should be a little bit alert, at least after a few weeks, of for when you think the nagging injury might have gone away. So for example, let's say your knee hurts squatting, and if you're walking upstairs, it hurts just a tiny little bit. Like it, you can just feel it. It's not a pain. You're like, oh, there it is. I did. If I really, if I squatted, it would hurt. And hack squats and leg presses don't hurt at all. So you've been three weeks, four weeks hammering away hacks and leg presses. Legs are bigger and stronger than ever. And you notice like, you know, someone maybe like, you know, your girlfriend comes over and she's like, oh, hey, uh, let's go upstairs. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll walk with you slow because I know your knee hurts. And you're like, does it? And you're halfway up the stairs at this point. You're like, it actually doesn't feel weird at all. To be honest, I forgot my knee ever hurt. So maybe I'm good. Now, here's the thing. A lot of the stuff is kind of obvious. If you really just don't even remember the injury even bothering you, then there's a decent chance that it's gone away. Of course, there's a chance that if you test the actual squat, it still sucks, it still hurts. But if it's one of those things where you know day in and day out that the injury still hurts, you try to brush your teeth and your forearm's like, ah, clearly I've inspected. Every day I brush my teeth, I inspect, and the answer is no. Uh, it, it's a good idea to keep on alert for when maybe this injury starts to go away and or it still continues. If and when you've inspected and been aware and realized, hey, I think I might actually be recovered or let's see if I am because it's not clear to me I'm hurt anymore. Try to do, and this is a huge point, some very light reps with the main exercise that used to hurt it. So if squatting was hurting your knees, try some light 45 pound or even unweighted squats, okay? Most people's answer to this is wildly wrong, and it's, hey, I don't feel like anything's wrong anymore. I'm going to work up to my max. Don't do that. There's no point in it. I promise. You're still a good person deep down, even if you don't have your one rep max in the squat recorded in your notebook every three days, okay? So very light reps and see if it how it feels. If it still hurts, go back to step number three, which is, you know, keep on or redesign another program with exercises that don't hurt it. If it doesn't hurt, then you move on to the next step, which is step number seven. Step number seven is easing in. Assuming that you even want to use that exercise, because here's the deal. You might have like six to 10 really good tricep exercises, only barbell skull crushers hurt your elbow. Everything else doesn't. You might have taken away barbell skull crushers last mesocycle because they started nagging your elbows. And then you might have used two or three other ones. But there's like, I don't know, seven other exercises you could be using. And maybe barbell skull crushers aren't even your favorite. So you don't have to come back to it right away. But if you want to come back to it right away, you, keep, you ease in. And my best recommendation 
is if you're taking those older exercises that used to hurt you, don't put them first in the program. Uh, let's say you have some chest work and some tricep work and you have two tricep exercises at the end after chest work. Don't put skull crushers that used to hurt your elbows as your first tricep exercise. Put them as your last one so you can do them very, very light and keep the alternate exercises as your heavy ones. So if you, the dumbbell skull crushers felt great, still do those as exercise one for the tricep. Exercise two, instead of overhead rope extensions, try the barbell skull crushers and see if it, you know, because you already tested it in point number six and it felt fine with really lightweight. Now you're gonna try it with moderate weight, higher reps, still very good technique, nice and slow. And if it doesn't hurt, go all up, go a bit heavier, go a bit heavier. And after a while, then you're actually good to go. So point number eight is the, is the diagnose point. If this number seven of reintroducing that exercise as a lighter variation goes well and you keep progressing and it keeps going, uh, you're done. Like you no longer have an hanging injury. And then the next muscle, you can put it first in the program. It's probably going to feel fine. You're good to go. However, if the injury uh, never goes away to begin with, or it comes back, or if retrying with light weights shows you that it's still there two or three times in a row after a month or two of backing off and you're still not better, then it's probably time to go see a sports medicine doctor because there might be something in there that some therapy or some drugs or some surgery could take care of and it might be a little bit more serious than you thought. Folks, that's it. Uh, be smart. Be smart and be patient and you're going to get jacked. You're going to get strong very smoothly if you intelligently move away from when things are bad, right? Not just plowing through when 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 things are are bad. Plowing through gets you almost nothing, right? Like if you're in a combat situation when, you know, whatever kind of combat video games you play and there's like 50 troops and a tank coming this way and two troops and one of them ran out of bullets this way and you're behind a house, you don't like run into the tank and the troops and die. That's running into the nagging injury. You go, okay, this is bad. Pivot, run in and kill those two guys with small arms and then regroup with your buddies and go kill the tank and all the other guys. That's just basically what we're talking about here in training terms is, you know, skull crushers hurt your elbows. Stop doing skull crushers. Do something else, then ease back in later. And if it works, great. If not, you got some thinking to do. Folks, thank you so much and see you next time. Hopefully less hurt.